Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is lesson number 13 in a series called Family Seasons. We've been talking about events that happen to families through the different stages of life and all kinds of things that can happen. This particular lesson is entitled Turning Hearts in the End Time. It's lesson number 13 for June 29 of 2019. I think you'll find this a really challenging lesson, a good one, but we, as always, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we have come here to think about your word, to discuss the issues that are important, especially as we think about the times which are coming up, we hope soon, as this world draws to a conclusion. May we represent you correctly as what we say this evening and as we look forward to the future is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've been with us through a number of these sessions, you know that we've talked about a lot of different issues. And sometimes we do fairly well and sometimes we don't do so well. Fortunately, we have promises, don't we? Yes. And for those who remain faithful to the Bible and faithful to the truth about God, there is a guaranteed glorious outcome. No way to miss it. We may lose our lives. Someone could shoot us in the head. But it doesn't matter. If we've got that relationship with God, there's going to be a glorious ending, right? How many people do we know of that are already people, humans, that are already in heaven? Three. Who are they? Enoch, Moses, Elijah. Okay. There were also some who went... Right. Yeah, uh, but we don't know them by name. We don't know them. We don't know their experiences. So the ones we know about are... I figure Lazarus has to be there. He wouldn't have to die again. There's no record of it. That's just pure... We don't know. These are the ones we know about. Somebody went. Yeah. If he died died the second time, that would be a second death for him, wouldn't it? So maybe he's escaped well, that. that. Is he was part of the group that went to. It's a nice thought. But that, if recall. that was the case, he had a very short life after after being resurrected. Right. Well, and this, we don't know much about Enoch, but we know quite a lot about Moses and we know quite a lot about Elijah. We're going to focus particularly on Elijah. There's a couple of so-called Elijahs in the Bible. We're going to look at both of them. There was the prophet in the Old Testament, we'll talk about, and then there was the New Testament Elijah. Who was the New Testament Elijah? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And that comes out of this particular quotation, which in Protestant Bibles is the last two verses in the Old Testament. And I quote Malachi 4, 5, and 6, But before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, we're going to talk about when that is, I will send you the prophet Elijah. He'll bring fathers and children together again. Otherwise, I will have I would have to come and destroy your country. Wow. That's kind of almost like a threat, isn't it? <laughs> well, has the great and terrible day of the Lord happened yet? What does that mean? Surely the quiet coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago, being a little baby boy born in a stable isn't the great and terrible day of the Lord, I don't think. So when will that come? Well, we'll think about that as we move through our story here. We do know that Jesus repeatedly said that who is going to be the Elijah? Be John the, to accept it. It's John. John the Baptist. Matthew eleven fourteen and 15, 17, 10, Mark 6, 15, and Luke 1, 17. Said, Jesus just said, that John the Baptist was Elijah. But you were suggesting that there's going to be another Elijah. Well, hold on. We're going to get there. I just want to plant a seed. (laughs) Okay. Well, the prophet Malachi lived about 400 years before Christ. He presented, if you read through the book of Malachi, a very sad picture of things around Jerusalem in his day. The people basically seemed to be mocking. Every time Malachi would say something... They would basically mock him. But we do know... It's almost like uh, the Laodicean condition. Oh, dear. 
<laughs> now you're I mean, kind of talking about us. Well, uh, you know, but yeah. you don't know that you, you know, you think that you're this way, but you don't know that you're this way. And if you go yeah. through Malachi, yeah. it's, you, you know, this is wrong, but, but how have we... Yeah, have we been wrong in that way, and, and then he goes on to say, you know, mm -hmm. you've robbed God. I mean, well, how? We're in what way and have you robbed? We robbed God in mm. tithes and offerings. So mm. there's a whole bunch of the yep. sequence of these, and it's it's almost like the same message as yep. as uh, Laodicea message. Well, how did Elijah get to heaven? Chariot. Chariot. In a fiery chariot, huh? Wow. Flying. What? Without dying. Yeah. Most of us need to do. Well, why did you think Moses and Elijah were chosen to come and encourage Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? And they symbolized those who would be resurrected on the one hand, Moses, and those who would be translated, Elijah. Okay, well, that's part of the answer. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, God could have sent down Gabriel. Wouldn't he have done a better job at... You know, encouraging Jesus and Moses or Elijah? Well, one theory is that Moses and Elijah, having been humans, or had uh, some personal connection with the struggles that Jesus was going through. Yeah. So what does it mean then to turn the hearts of people? Any, we're going to do cardiac surgery here? Or? <laughs> no. Change in character. Changing character, drawing people closer to God. Yeah. Pointing them to the light, yeah. giving them a choice so that they can, their heart turns to the light. God has been calling people to him from day one. And yet so many have, have most of the history of our world has been one of gross rebellion. But occasionally there have been people's, groups of people that have come back to God. But why do you think Malachi mentions specifically bringing fathers and children together again? What does that have to do with this whole picture? Well, fathers could be the, uh, the um, more conservative, established element and the children, of course, are the more liberal, let, let's see what things are all about. Mm -hmm. So bringing those two uh, elements, which we all have in us, it should mm -hmm. be a feedback loop, are, uh, it's part of, of wholeness, because yeah. otherwise we'll tend to polarize, you know. Yeah. This is the way we've always done it. Well, it doesn't work for me, so I'm going to do it different. this way. Well, clearly, I mean, I don't think any of us would argue about the fact that the family is the basic building block of society. And that's where children are taught, where they learn by example, and hopefully, hopefully they learn how to prepare themselves for the second coming of Jesus. And Jesus, what, what was he... When someone asked him about the basic teachings of the Old Testament, what did he say? Love God. God love Christ. God and love your fellow man, right? And it, that was a brand new teaching, right? No, he quoted the Old Testament. You mean a Leviticus 19.18 says something like that? Look at that. Do not take revenge on anyone or continue to hate him, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am the Lord. Wow. That's from the New Testament, right? That was from the Leviticus 19.18. And then I'm going to look at Deuteronomy 6.5. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Never forget these commandments that I'm giving you today. Jesus straight quoted from, from Moses. Well, is there a relationship between yeah, loving God asked, and... I what? if you asked most people yeah. where those came from, they would have no idea that uh, it was from the Old Testament. Yeah. As well as the New Testament. Yes. Especially in Leviticus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think about it. Yeah. Deuteronomy, it's sensible well, there. And if you read the chapter before and after that passage, you would say, whoa, you know, you, 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 you wonder if that stuff should even be in the Bible. <laughs> well, is there a relationship between loving God and love our, loving our fellow men and women? Yes. yes, in 1 John three seventeen, 
the rhetorical question is asked, but whoever has of this world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And then over in chapter 4, uh, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. Mm-hmm. So there's a, and then you could down, go down to 11 and 20 also, mm-hmm. and through that whole section, there, if we don't love God, you know, how can, uh, he asked the question later on, how, if you say that you love God and hates his, um, your neighbor, yeah, who does not love his brother whom he has <coughs> seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Yeah. If you have a chance, I would encourage you very strongly to read the chapter entitled Carmel in the book Prophets of Kings. Let's talk about that a little bit. Ahab was a terrible king. He was more wicked than any of the Israelite kings before him. Worst of all, he married the daughter of the king of Sidon, who was determined to convert all the people of the kingdom of Israel into worshippers of Baal and Ashtoreth. Unfortunately, with the help of the devil, she did a remarkably good job. Wish, would that the converting people back were as easy. Well, I wish that the conversion had gone the other way. Yeah. Well, I wonder why it was so important to her. Kind she of was an evangelist. Oh, a woman evangelist? She's, her father was the high priest of Baal. And she was a priestess, I guess. Yeah. She took her job pretty serious. In. Yeah. Pretty successful. So try to imagine... Given that little bit of background, try to imagine the story. Here's Elijah. He's dressed in a country bumpkin suit. <laughs> I mean, whatever. I mean, he, nothing special at all. Nobody's ever seen him before. He walks into the king's palace, walks right up to the king and says, it's not going to rain until I say so. And everybody's going, huh? And before they realized what was going on, Elijah was gone. They couldn't find him. So where did Elijah go? Brook Cherith. He went back to the Brook Cherith, which is very close to his hometown, but on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And he stayed there for a period of time. I have had the privilege of actually going there and taking some pictures of the Brook Cherith on one of my trips. So he was hiding there. He was hiding. And then what happened? Well, while he was hiding there, we're told that he got water from the, from the brook and he was fed by the ravens. There's an interesting <laughs> thing that probably is not serious, but uh, it turns out that a nickname for some of the traders who would pass through that area was ravens. So some people say, well, maybe it was the traders Pavins, who had the nickname ravens were the ones he got his food from, or maybe it was the real birds. Mm-hmm. Probably the real Twice birds. Twice a day? I yeah. don't think no, so. No, probably not. <laughs> well, so what happened next? God says, I have another plan for you. Go to Zarephath. Where is Zarephath? Why did he go? The stream dried up. The stream dried up. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. There was a reason. Yeah. So he headed off. Where was Zarephath? Just south of um, Sidon. All the way across the (laughs) the nation of Israel, all the way through into Tyre and Sidon, and right under the nose of Jezebel's father. (laughs) Pretty good place to hide. (laughs) One you'd never think of. <laughs> yeah, very incredible story, really. And you wonder, you know, people that are living there on the sea coast, couldn't they have got some fish to eat? Right. Only if they had the methods of collecting the fish. Yeah. Only if they had fishing boats or some way of getting nets in. Well, let's, let's think about that now, okay? We have, Ellen White spells the story of Jezebel out quite nicely. Dennis, I think you can help us with that. Yeah, this is from Prophets and Kings, and I'll do one par- paragraph and pass it on. Jezebel utterly refused to recognize the drought as a judgment from Jehovah. Unyielding in her determination to defy the God of heaven, she with nearly the whole of Israel united in denouncing Elijah as the cause of all their misery. Had he not borne testimony against their forms of worship, 
If only he could be put out of the way, she argued, the anger of their gods would be appeased and their troubles would end. Of course. <laughs> Terry. Terry? Yes. Urged on by the queen, Ahab instituted a most diligent search for the hiding place of the prophet. To the surrounding nations, far and near, he sent messages to seek for the man whom he hated yet feared. And in his anxiety to make the search as thorough as possible, he required of these kingdoms and nations an oath that they knew nothing of the whereabouts of the <laughs> prophet. I have to chuckle when I hear that. The search was in vain. The prophet was safe from the malice of the king whose sins had brought upon the land the denunciation of an offended god. And Jim, you're going to... Failing up? in her efforts against Elijah, Jezebel determined to avenge herself by slaying all the prophets of Jehovah that were in Israel. Not one should be left alive. The infuriated woman carried out her purpose in the massacre of many of God's servants. Not all, however, perished. Obadiah, the governor of Ahab's house, yet faithful to God, took a hundred, he took a hundred prophets and at the risk of his own life hid them fifty <laughs> to a cave and fed them with bread and water. Now, how come he can get by with that, living in the house, and Jezebel doesn't know about it? Exactly. It doesn't see. Just make a good movie. So, it's an inside yeah. job. Yes, they didn't think that... <laughs> they didn't think that anyone be working for Ahab would be a prophet. What an incredible story. Amazing. Elijah was hiding very near Jezebel's father's home, and no one noticed. Try to imagine having... Think about this. This is a small town. It, it's in a it's in a cove, in on right on the Mediterranean. It's not a big city at all. It's still there. Try to imagine a widow with one son, living in a small village. Suddenly, a strange single man showed up and began living with them. It must have been apparent fairly soon that they were the only ones in the town who still had food. How could one? How could you hide that? You know, I don't. I grew up in a town that had a whole 550 mem members in the whole town. They didn't do that outside, probably. They weren't chowing down on, on well, the Well, but even people. so, everybody else is dying of starvation. I mean, and, it, and you're, you look relatively healthy. I mean... Uh, three and a half years is quite a while. <laughs> yes, it is. You think about it. Well... It, um, I'm trying to go back and look for it, but uh, when when we talk about the uh, uh, the miracle of the oil and the yeah and the flour and how they were fed, it says her and all her household. Um, she may have had more than just a son there in the household, so maybe maybe uh, maybe she took in other boarders. That you know, would be because he lived up on a. Yeah, an upper upstairs room. room. Maybe she took in boarders or had a... She was So now that she has a food supply, she can take in boarders. Huh? But, I mean, I think know. about it. She said, we've got this enough to make one little bread here, and then we're going to die. So it doesn't sound like she had boarders at that point. Yeah, I... I well, there's lots of questions. These stories, I'm sure there's going to be all kinds of fascinating aspects of these stories we know nothing about. Yeah. We're going to get to heaven, we're going to find, so, hey... Tell, tell us what really happened. And I think that God is probably going to have the whole thing preserved in 3D living color and we'll be able to see it exactly as it happened. Well, we don't know anything about this widow except a few notes about her time there with Elijah. When her son died, she was very upset, as you, I mean, wouldn't we all be upset? But then Elijah prayed to God and miraculously brought him back to life. I'm sure that she felt deeply rewarded for the trust she had placed in Elijah. Would you be willing to give the last bit of food you had in your house in a time of starvation to a stranger? So why do you think she did it? Well, it's interesting that uh, when he asked her to do that, she says, as the Lord your God lives. How did she know that he had? Well, she, she must have known that he was from Israel. But why would she invoke God's name? 
Uh, I have they, no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl, and so forth and so on. But as, why would she invoke Israel's God? Okay, well, let's think about that. Something. Let's think about that for a minute. What's happening here? This is a showdown between Yahweh or Jehovah and, and Baal, right? Mm -hmm. And now he's hiding in, a, in the territory of who? Baal. This is Baal's territory. So now we, uh, we, need to, we need to expand our thinking. It's not just the children of Israel in their territory that are being affected. This is Baal's territory now. And they're being affected. And don't you think they had some questions? And, and I'm sure the message got around. Well, the reason this drought has happened is because there's a guy by the name of Elijah. She probably felt impressed <coughs> that there was something special about him. And he probably said, you might have heard, there's a guy by the name of Elijah. Well, that's me. <laughs> well, and God sent her there, yeah. so he he knew where to send her. You know, yeah. but later on, she was Elijah says, "I'm the only one left," and God says, "No, I've got five thousand who haven't been to me, or whatever whatever number, a huge yeah. number." Yeah. So he apparently had somebody even up in Tyre and Sidon. This, yeah, this is this is Baal territory. Gordon, you were going to comment. It was made. So okay. Well, one of the major sins of Baal worshippers was offering their children as sacrifices to their God. You can read about that. All right, let me just read a couple of those passages. Jeremiah 19.5 And they have built altars for Baal in order to burn their children in the fire as sacrifices. I never commanded them to do this. It never even entered my mind. Mm. I, I, you know, I, I, mean, I, I just, I don't even know what to say. To imagine it was what it was like to burn one of your children. Where did that idea first start? Let's not talk about it too much. Mm. Yeah. Gruesome. Yeah. That was pagan. Okay, will the Lord be pleased? I mean, look at Micah 6, famous passage here, 7 and 8. Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? I mean, look, that's the Baal stuff. No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Wow. Well, the story of Elijah is not over yet, is it? What happens next? God says, go back, talk to Ahab, call the children of Israel to Mount Carmel. We're going to have a showdown. Take care of business. Take care, <laughs> take care of business. There you go. So, what happened on Mount Carmel? Rebuilt the altar right in front of. There was an old altar that had been built for worshiping Jeho Jehovah or Yahweh. There and and and. But what happened before that? I mean, I try to imagine. This is I, the thing I, I try to think of. This whole whenever I do this stuff, maybe in my imagination is too wild, but. Think about the 850 prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth marching from Jezreel to Mount Carmel. What do you suppose they were thinking? We got this covered. Yeah. 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 We're going to pulverize that Elijah. Hmm. We're going to finish him off. And what happened? Did they have any idea what was coming? Probably not. And so what did Elijah say to them when they got there? Okay. You say you have a God. I have a God. Let's have a showdown, right? So here's the showdown. Build yourself an altar. Put on the wood. Put on the sacrifice. Pray to God. If you've got a real God, he'll send fire, right? Wow. <laughs> I don't think they were expecting that. And 850 of them. Yeah. You know... You know, what would they be doing? Somebody's over there out behind the crowd starting a little fire and he's got a, you know, some few embers, red coals or something like this when, when nobody's looking and he's going to run in there and sneak them under the... Why didn't that work? God didn't allow it. 
I mean, you can absolutely bet that the devil would have lit that fire instantly if God had allowed it. So I, I don't think there's any question about the fact that any attempts that were made were foiled by God. It had to be. And so what happened then next? At the time of the evening sacrifice, about 3 p.m., he, Elijah called all the people together. They, the, 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 the Baal people, the Ashtoreth people hadn't managed to do anything. Elijah calls them all together and he says, let's build up this altar. He did it. He put the wood on it. He put the sacrifice on it. He says, now I want you to bring 12 large pitchers of water, four at a time. Pour it over this. I want. I don't want anybody to think that I did by something by sneaky method here. And what happened? So where did all that water come from? Yeah. Well, yeah. Top it's of Mount Carmel. Yeah. It's it's a relatively short distance down to the Mediterranean. Oh, so you could bring it up. I I have to assume that must have been where it came from. But it was. It would still take a while to do it. Yeah. This is a little aside, but there's a real interesting Messianic Jewish community that has a chapel on top Mount Carmel right mm -hmm. now. And you can actually listen to their services. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Well, we've, I've been up there. There's a place where they show you this is the place. Well, who knows whether that's a real place, but it's interesting to visit. Ken? Yeah? Um, back on uh, the prophets of Baal trying to yeah. start the fire, First Kings eighteen twenty seven says at noon Elijah started making fun of them. Pray louder. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe your God is dreaming or relieving himself and so on. Is that the thing that we should do? Egg on the opposition? Not the attention of the people who were bystanders. <laughs> yeah. Well is is that what the purpose was for Elijah saying things like that? Well, I mean obviously Jezebel had been making fun of Yahweh for years. So we should make fun of Baal? <laughs> I'm just saying that... Uh, Depends it, on your personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But God had stopped Elijah. the rain. Yeah. And those 840 people couldn't make it rain. At least the scribes didn't have... Uh, uh, it wasn't egging Elijah on. In, yeah. in his <laughs> well, in that, Elijah knelt down. He offered a simple prayer. And suddenly lightning struck from heaven and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the water and left a black hole in the ground. One short prayer, one immediate response. And the obvious response came from the crowds. Yeah. Yahweh, he is God. I mean, what else could you possibly say? And of course, they all became faithful followers of Yahweh after that, right? <laughs> Not quite. Not quite? Mm -hmm. Just 90% of them, huh? Well, the story of Elijah in the Old Testament makes it clear that God will go to almost any length to bring his responding children back to himself. Try to imagine the conversations that took place that evening in the homes of the Israelite people after the Elijah on the Mount Carmel experience. What do you think kids ask their parents? All sorts of questions. I guess you, you, didn't, you didn't get lightning strikes of that magnitude every day, for starters. Well, where was Baal? He could have given a lightning strike, right? He was supposed to be the he's supposed to be the god of the storm, right? Well, there's an interesting verse over in the New Testament that we need to think about. It's in Revelation 13, verse 13. The second beast, and this would be one of Satan's companions performed great miracles that made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. Does that sound familiar? Why couldn't he do it on Mount Carmel? Yeah. Satan had been, has been waiting for thousands of years to imitate God's miracle on Mount Carmel. Finally, he will be given permission. What will be our response? Are we ready for that? Be careful. Well, we've already mentioned there are a number of verses where Jesus specifically says that Elijah, the Old Testament, will be, will, will be followed by another Elijah in the New Testament. And, of course, it was John the Baptist. Did John the Baptist recognize that he was the Elijah to come? 
Did his parents ever teach him anything like that? Well, I mean, clearly... What? I say probably because they were warned that... They were told, weren't they? Um, Surely his preaching mirrored much of what Elijah did. So why do you suppose that one man... I mean, think of Hyde Park Corner in, in, in London. Think of, you know, Times Square in New York City. I mean, if you... This guy went away from the crowds. He's out in the desert there and he starts preaching and everybody flocks to him. I mean, how do you get that kind of response? How many evangelists would love to get that kind of a response? And how did he communicate that to those people to know that he was out in the desert? The children of Israel have been waiting for hundreds of years for the Elijah to show up. Even King Herod loved to listen to him even though it made him feel very guilty because he was married to his brother's wife, Herodias. Well, John had a revolutionary message. Not only were people to confess their sins and be baptized, but also they were to share with the poor. Let me just look at part of that. So John went throughout, this is uh, Luke 3, starting with verse 3. So John went throughout the whole territory of the River Jordan, preaching, turn away from your sins and be baptized and God will forgive your sins. So it may be that he didn't just start way out there in the desert and wait for people to come to him. He apparently marched up and down the Jordan River and eventually, when a great crowd started to gather, why well, he, he moved to a place where it was a little more remote, where he, people could gather. And because he wasn't, he was still baptizing in the Jordan, so he wasn't too far out in the desert. And he said, "What? Turn away from your sins. Be baptized, and God will forgive your sins." Which, and, which is the God will forgive your sins because you're baptized or because you turn from your sins? Turn away from your sins and be baptized. So and it's then. not just some ceremony we go through to this get rid of not, our sins. This is not a formula for salvation. As it is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, someone is shouting in the desert, so he knew about those verses. Get the road ready for the Lord. Make a straight path for him to travel. Every valley must be filled up. Every hill and mountain leveled off. The winding roads must be made straight and the rough paths made smooth. The whole human race will see God's salvation. Crowds of people came out to John to be baptized by him. You snakes, he said. He was a real friendly guy, huh? Who told, who told you you could escape from the punishment of God is, with punishment God is about to send? Do those things that... Do those things that will show that you have turned from your sins. And don't start saying among yourselves that Abraham is your ancestor. I tell you that God can take these stones and make descendants for Abraham. The axe is ready to cut down the tree at the roots. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire, etc. So, he had a very pretty plain message. He said, "Don't whatever you've got, share with the poor. Don't cheat anybody in the transactions you do. And don't make any false accusations. So if a preacher came preaching that way today, um, what do you think would happen? 5150 time. 5150, send him off to the, the, loony, the loony house, huh? Well, there are people, uh, you brought it before, Hyde Park. You know, in Central Square in New York. You know, there are people saying things like this all the time, and they end up in the loony farm. Yes. Just as as Carrie says. But it it also lets off a bit of steam before it gets to that. Yeah. They've got one in Sydney in Australia. I had to bail out one of my patients the next day. I couldn't find him anywhere, and he got into a brawl with the police. Uh So they locked him up for the night. Eventually, I. I went everywhere and eventually called the jail. Yes, we've got him here. You can come get him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well uh, what, what was the role of the Holy Spirit in all of that? There's, there's almost no question about the fact that John's parents were dead before he began any of his ministry. Uh, in, in the Jewish custom, you had to be 30 years old, and the Bible specifically says that in Luke 3, 30 years old before you start preaching. So his parents were elderly before he was born, remember. But many scholars believe that John left Jerusalem, didn't go back there basically because things were so corrupt in Jerusalem. 
And he went down, he lived somewhere around the Dead Sea. And who else lived down there? Essenes. And what do we know about the Essenes? They wrote and kept the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. And they lived a very austere life, lifestyle. They had, oh man, I mean, you had to go through an elaborate process on Fridays to prepare yourself because you were not allowed to go to the bathroom on Sabbath. Okay. Boy, they were fanatics. Really? You think so? Well, that seems ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Good thing we don't have any of those around today. Yeah, right. But John knew he was not the Messiah. He had received a message from God that the Messiah was coming. And Yoli, I think oh. you got that message for us. Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins and closely related by the circumstances of their birth. Yet, they had no direct acquaintance with each other. The life of Jesus had been spent at Nazareth in Galilee, that of John in the wilderness of Judea. Amid widely different surroundings, they had lived in seclusion and had had no communication with each other. Providence had ordered this. No occasion was to be given for the charge that they had conspired together to support each other's claims. That's Ellen White's Desire of Ages. Okay, page 109. 109. Yeah, very, very important point. Mm -hmm. When Jesus finally arrived on the banks of the Jordan and John saw him, John knew immediately that this was the promised Messiah. And there's the verses, John 1, 29, 35... We'll probably, I think we're going to do an okay. Let's look at those verses. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him and said, There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How do you suppose you would, if you had been a good Jew, how would you have understood that comment? Well, well about the same as take up your cross and follow me. You know, it... it there they didn't know what, what in the world. What What does this mean? They what, They were certainly knew about? what the cross was, you know, and they knew what a lamb was for. But uh, the connection would be difficult. So, what kind of sign do you think John received that made him know that this was Jesus? Well, reading on further, there he he tells us, "I have seen this." Uh, John testified, saying, I've seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and I rema he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize said to me, so this is some heavenly visitor, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to observe that at that baptism, who was present? What, who were the most important people who were present? God the Father. God, God the Father. Spoke. God the Son. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they were all three of them there present at the, on that occasion. Well, what did John's disciples think when John called Jesus the Lamb of God? What must have gone through their minds when they thought about lambs? It's interesting to note that when they heard the message about Jesus, those disciples of John almost immediately went to alert their friends and relatives to come and see him. By that time, Jesus had completed the 40 days in the wilderness and clearly showed marks of that experience. What do you think John would say if he showed up in your church one Sabbath morning? <laughs> Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you mean that? message might still need to be taught I think so or if he came to your front door yeah what about it? what if he came to your home well we still haven't answered the question when when will the great and terrible day of the Lord come so now let's get to uh, that question from testimonies to the church volume 3 page 62 Ellen White those who are to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ are represented by faithful Elijah as John came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for Christ's first advent. And Ellen White from Southern Watchman, the work of John the Baptist and the work of those who in the last days go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to arouse the people from their apathy are in many respects the same. 
His work is a type of the work that must be done in this age. Christ is to come the second time to judge the world in righteousness. So, what are we saying? We're saying that there's going to be a forerunner. There was a forerunner before Jesus when he came the first time. And there's going to be forerunners, plural, maybe, before he comes the second time. Is that possible? Well, we know that what God wants. Let's let's look at a verse, a couple of verses on that. Second Corinthians five. All this is starting with verse eighteen. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into His friends and gave us the task of making others His friends also. Our message is that God was making the whole human race His friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and He has given us the message which tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin in order that in union with him we might share the righteousness of God. Are we doing that? This is transformative. I mean... Paul delighted in in Ephesians 2. It talks about breaking down the wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles. Are there there still walls in the Christian church today? Of course. What? Of course. The scripture we just read, I prefer the one who speak of us becoming from enemies to sons, I'll add daughters. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of walls exist in the Christian church today? Husbands and wives don't love each other and get divorced wow. in the Christian church. Mm. Mm. Parents and children don't get along and the children leave home. Yeah. And churches split over silly issues like yeah. what kind of music should be played in church and things like that. Color of the carpet. The, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Reserve me. No, but the sad thing is that a divorce happens. We have a good friend. A divorce happens, and the church, two different circumstances in both places, church is polarized. They take the side of who they... Yes. A- and she's in the running club. Yeah. At Arden Hills Church, you know. They're just split on this after this divorce. Yeah. yeah. Wow. The devil will do anything to yeah. divide us. So are we? Now we're going to ask some touch, tough questions in the last few minutes we have here. Are we as a church, or even as individual families, demonstrating the unselfish, caring, lasting commitment to God that was shown by Elijah and John the Baptist? And how will we respond when the day comes when we have to choose between Worshiping God despite international laws calling for the death penalty on anyone who who is following God or following the the world and and living comfortably. Our families can be a great sermon. Have they been so? Myra? Well, the most powerful sermon that can be given the unbelieving world in recommendation of our faith is a well-disciplined family. Children are that are educated to the habits of self-denial and self-control and are taught to be courteous, kind, and affectionate will make an impression upon the minds like nothing else can. Hmm. That's pretty powerful stuff, huh? We We profess to be children of the King and to be part of God's family. Is that obvious to everyone around us? If you have a few minutes, read the chapter entitled The Voice in the Wilderness. It's the story of John the Baptist and Desire of Ages, pages 97 to 108. It'll be a real blessing to you. John was uh, not noted for being subtle, at least not what we know about him. His rebukes were very straightforward, and he did not care who he rebuked if they needed it. Jim? Our message must be as direct as was that of John. He rebuked kings for their iniquity. Notwithstanding the peril his life was in, he never allowed truth to languish on his lips. 
Our work in this age must be as faithfully done. Ellen White comments, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4. And what happened to John as a result of being so blunt? He lost his head. He got on a put, head was put on a platter. Yeah. Well, well, I thought we were supposed to be diplomatic. Yes. Very Aren't diplomatic. we supposed to win people over by winsomeness? If, you, if you're warning people that the world is about to come to an end, it's probably time to stop being so diploma- diplomatic. But is that is that the message that we that we should have? Is that the message scaring the people? In the, no, in, in scaring them is not going to do the job. What we're saying here is, when we say we're talking about being bold, we're saying instead of sort of, oh no, I I, I don't think I should speak up. Yeah, so I agree with that. I yeah, mean, but it's courage just, uh, to speak up to represent yeah. the kingdom. Yeah. Paul says are, we are healed by his life, mm-hmm. Romans five ten, and. Uh, we need to, to learn about just what did he say the eternal life is to know the Father and the Son where do we find that out the most concentrated is in the four Gospels yeah well in Jesus' life um, he began you know trying to hold things back because he knew what if he mm-hmm. went out and said I'm the Messiah people would it would yeah. be over very shortly but uh, it was, you know, the the scribes and Pharisees had three, three and a half years to respond to the message. And at the end, he gave some very decided, uh, cutting, rebuking statements. But that was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These people had already point, passed the point where they could. If you go back and read very carefully mm-hmm. the book of John, his first visit to the, uh, his first after he was baptized and after this first visit to the first Passover and read what Ellen White says they wanted to kill him at that very first Passover and yet if you read into Acts you find out that some of the scribes and Pharisees became leaders of the church yes believers and leaders okay so let's talk about our church do we dare do that There are three very interesting verses in the book of Revelation. Let me read those. Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. Or have the test... Well, and another one is found in Revelation 14, 12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people. Those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. And we have another passage. It's over there in Revelation 19.10. Let me go there very quickly. And you all know this by memory, right? I'm just going to read the last part of the verse. For the truth that Jesus revealed is what inspires the prophets. But we have learned it. What did we learn? To How did we learn those? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then in 19.10 is for... Yeah, this here is, yeah, this verse is the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And how have we interpreted that down through the years? The writings. We are the ones who keep the commandments of God and we have the spirit of prophecy, right? Because we have Ellen White. Yes, we have Ellen White. Implication there. Well, think about it. Does the fact that you have the writings of a dead prophet make you unique? No, almost all every, Christians oh. have. Yeah, almost every, every, <laughs> Hold on here, folks. They purport to have that. Every yeah. religion. Well, the word prophet from the Greek means someone who speaks on the behalf of someone else or an ambassador. Do we qualify as a group of people to speak the truth about God to the world? And if so, are we doing that? Come on, we've got to... Can you yeah. think of the exa- yeah. Well, to some degree, yeah. Okay. Can you think of the examples of some personal friends or family members who have had their lives turned around and their hearts turned back to God? If so, in your Sabbath school class, talk about their stories. There are also times when God speaks very bluntly. All you have to do is read a little bit of the Old Testament and you'll see that. A careful reading of the prophets of the Old Testament will virtually always give you the impression that God has a fourfold message. 
Jackie, I think you you can speak for God here. You can be the ambassador. Number one, I, God, have saved you and treated you well. Number two, you have rejected me. Number three, terrible devastation will follow your rebellion. And four, in the end, I will forgive, save, and restore you. Wow. What a message. What a message. What a message. Well, we come back to our verse that we started out with, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Let's read it one more time. But before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, I will send you the prophet Elijah. So now, what do we know about the great and terrible day of the Lord? It's not come yet. It hasn't come yet. When is it going to come? When Jesus comes. Just before the second coming, just as Elijah, the New Testament Elijah, came before the first coming, right? Then it goes on, he will bring fathers and children together again, Otherwise, I would have to come and destroy your country. How are those things related? One question. Yes. Is it one day or a span of time? Or does it matter? The great and terrible day of the mm-hmm. Lord? Well, probably it's referring to the actual day when Jesus shows up. But we know that the events that lead up to that are going to be great and terrible, don't we? I like the final end of sin and sinners at the third company. Yeah. Coming is really the final day of uh, everything. But for us, the day of the Lord is today because we may not yeah. wake tomorrow. Yep. So everyone has to make your choice today so and not do. wait. I have a, a patient, or I should maybe I should say I had a patient, was a lady that had a lot of problems, a, a lot of medical problems, and her daughter took her children to, to school one day and, and just I mean, the amount of time it took to go and take the kids to school and came back and mom was cold. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just like that. Yeah. So why do you think at the end of Matthew 11, 11 to 14, as Jesus talked about John, he ended with the words, listen then if you have ears. Mm-hmm. Where, where else do we read that expression, listen if you have ears? Revelation. Uh, several times in the book of Revelation, hasn't it? So, At the end of each of the, yeah. the uh, cities. So what is God trying to tell us by that, saying those words? Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Uh, Are we ignoring that message? Sometimes. If we don't yes. have ears to hear. Okay. Yeah. Dennis, I think you've got something on that. Yes, the, uh, this is from... The adult teacher's um, study guide. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 2. This command of John's is the identical phrase that Jesus spoke in his ministry, Matthew four seventeen. Commanding people to repent may sound tactless in our ears today, but it is important to remember that John was relatively successful. Hmm. People were baptized, confessing their sins, which gave such uh, what gave such impetus to this message wow well would we dare to be John the Baptist in our day Peter at Pentecost also was very straightforward about uh, recent events and people what should we do it's interesting to notice do I dare mention this that Probably the strongest words of all were addressed to the church leaders. Mm-hmm. Oh dear, did I say that? Well, that wasn't the to the leaders today. That was to the <laughs> leaders back then. <laughs> I see. It has no relevance to today. Does is it, it? Is it easier or more difficult to reach out to church leaders and convince them that some changes need to be made, or or to people reaching out to the people in the world? It's important to notice that John lived a very abstemious life. He had a very meager diet and lived in the wilderness. By contrast, Jesus went to banquets with sinners and tax collectors. So why do you think right there in the Gospels we have these two extremes working almost side by side? Is God trying to say something to us? Uh, Different journeys (laughs) and strategies. Yeah. 
Well, in Matthew eleven seventeen to 19, I won't read yeah. that right now, but he talks about your, this generation is like children yeah. in a marketplace, and you yeah. play your flutes, and you say, yeah. I played a dirge, and you didn't uh, mm-hmm. mourn, and I played another th- thing, and you didn't dance. In other words, yeah. people... No matter what you do, people are going to say, well, you didn't do what I want you, wanted you to do. There's an interesting comment about the way people divide themselves up sort of natural. It seems that some people tend to be more progressive and others tend to be more conservative. And many years ago, a G.K. Chesterton, way back in 1924, had some interesting words about that. Gary, I think you've got that. Yes. The whole modern world has divided itself into conservatives and progressives. The business of progressives is to go on making mistakes. The business of the conservatives is to prevent the mistakes from being corrected. <laughs> <laughs> sums it up, doesn't it? Tug in cheek. If you don't, if you want to check that out for yourself, the 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 location on the email, on the internet is there. Have any of us ever been accused of misrepresenting the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Look at the example of John. More people important, have we ever been accused of misrepresenting God? Yes. Look at the example of John. When people began to flock to Jesus and left him with not so many followers, what did he say? He must increase and I must decrease. For a while, for a while John was the most exciting thing happening in the nation of Israel. But when the Messiah showed up, he said, follow him. Are we pointing people in the right direction by our lives, in the words we speak? Could we be as humble as John the Baptist was? Do we reach out with kindness and sympathy, even placing our arms around new members who come to Sabbath school? We need to remember that church is not a club for saints. How often does it seem like that? It is a hospital for sinners. And the better the hospital, what happens? The sicker the patients that go there. That's a lesson we need to think about. What have you learned from this series of lessons? Do you feel more comfortable witnessing to others based on what you have learned? And what about that special audience that you deal with every day at home? Are you doing everything you can to reach your own children, all of us. Uh, Why should I be pointing at you? All of us. Are we doing everything we can to reach our own children, no matter what their ages are, and point them to the kingdom which is coming very soon? Our kind and wonderful Father, as we have gathered here and talked about your word, it's been a tremendous blessing to each one of us to think about these issues and ask these questions. May those who have listened in also benefit as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.